Hey everyone, Adam here, Swizzer Podcast. I have a really cool interview for you today. I got to sit down with writer, actress, uh, motivational speaker, overall creative awesome person, Naomi McDougal-Jones, to talk about her latest movie, Bite Me. Bite Me is a romantic comedy about uh, a vampire, but not the supernatural type, who's being audited by a, an IRS agent, and it kind of becomes a, um, a romantic comedy. It really inventive, really cool... And hearing about Naomi's journey to this and how she just kind of paved her own way and created her own way. And if a door wouldn't open, she just went around and found another one or created one. It's super inspirational for anybody who wants to create anything. She also did a TED Talk that has millions of uh, views on it. Uh, another inspirational thing. That part gets a little bit serious, but it's something important to hear. So talking to Naomi was just this fascinating thing all around. Uh, enjoy it because it was great. Hey everybody, Adam here. So was her podcast. I'm sitting down with Naomi McDougal Jones to talk about her newest movie, Bite Me. How you doing, Naomi? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. A um, little bit of a scheduling conflict we were just talking about, but this is this is cool. It's working out. So uh, before we get to Bite Me, I do like to ask creative people, and you're doing a lot. It seems you got a podcast going. You're an actress. You're a writer. You did a TED talk. I probably missed something else in there. But, uh, you're doing a lot. So, what was the first thing? Um, acting. Okay, and is that the like your main passion? Um, I think at this point it's probably writing, and writing is probably caught up, and and producing is probably caught up. But um, I think when you're a little girl and you find out that you're a storyteller, people tend to say, "Oh, well, then you should be an actress." Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was in plays all through being a kid and went to acting school and um, got out of acting school and, and the writing really came out of a frustration. I quickly developed with the roles available for women, which were uh, fairly uninteresting and naked. Um, and so I decided to just to start trying to write better parts for women. Create some real roles. <laughs> <laughs> so so you've known. Women. Sorry, go ahead. Some three-dimensional humans. Right. <laughs> Something you can act in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you knew from a really young age, it sounds like, that you kind of had your path set. I did. My mom tells the story that when I was four, she took me to see the Nutcracker um, in our town. And I stood up, like, as the thing was closing and said, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had that certainty when I was four of what I wanted to do. Because <laughs> I'm still not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there's merits to that too sure <laughs> we could say that <laughs> um were you uh from like the town you were in were you near like show business at all or was any of your family involved in show business or were you a total outsider just that's what i'm gonna do so i grew up in colorado um so not near any <laughs> show business <laughs> hub i will say that we had gr great community theater there as community theaters go and um like we had school plays, we had drama classes. Um, but I definitely like from the time that I understand that New York was where you are an actress, I was like laser beam focused on getting to New York. Um, and no, nobody in my family's in show business. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I would find it much more interesting when somebody, especially from a young age, is like, that's what I'm gonna do, and now you're doing it because yeah. it is such a hard industry to get into, especially with no. Like, oh, my aunt was an actress, you know, so I, you know, asked yeah. her and like, it's, I, I'm that sure I'm not telling anything you don't know. <laughs> no, that would have been super useful, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, why the thought of New York over, say, Los Angeles? I mean, it was just a kid thing. Like I, my, um, my, the, my, the person who's been my best friend for now 20 years, uh, Veronica Moonhill moved to my town when she, she, we were 12, I think. And I remember that we had, we were going to a theater camp together that summer and she seemed very worldly to me because she had lived in other places. Um, and we were sort of talking about theater and she was like, well, re real actresses live in New York. <laughs> but that was like it. That was like, okay, that's what she said. That's where I'm going. And did you follow through? You went to New York? <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, you made a lot of concrete decisions at young ages. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> I guess for theater, I would think New York too. Yeah, and I and I came to to it through theater 
largely, I think, because that's what was available to me. I mean, I always loved movies. And um, when I was a kid, <laughs> I, I, with the um, usually unwilling participation of my siblings and the neighbor kids, I would put on like word for word productions of movies that I loved. Like, I think we did a two and a half hour uh, version of The Wizard of Oz and The Sound of Music and later Grease, you know, <laughs> just like, so I certainly like I, the movies were probably the thing that influenced me the most, but the only thing that was really available to me was theater. Right, and um, movies, you it's more readily available than going to see a play because you can get a hundred of them right. you know, at any time. Right. Um, so I, I went to acting school thinking I would be a theater actress forever. Um, and, and I love Shakespeare. I'm a total Shakespeare geek. And so um, it was really hardcore theater and then got out of theater school and got cast much more consistently in films and on television. Um, and, and really fell in love with that medium because of course the beauty of theater is that it only exists in that one moment for those people there and like that's mm -hmm. the thrilling thing about it and it's also kind of the nightmarish thing about it <laughs> <laughs> like, I was you put all of this these work this work into a play and it exists and it's beautiful and it's fresh but then nobody can ever see it again so it is very very satisfying now to make movies that you know people still discover my first movie now and they watch it as though it's just happening uh, that's really cool. Yeah, that is the kind of timeless aspect of movies, because even if you discover a movie from the 60s, it's new to you. It's a new right. perspective. Right. Yeah, that's cool. So um, did you do uh, like a traditional education in acting? Did you go to New York to go to like a school, a performance school? So I am um, I out of high in, when I was in high school, I applied to 10 colleges and I only got into one. But the one was Cornell University. <laughs> oh, it's a good one. <laughs> was was this sort of bewildering thing because like I didn't get into my safety schools, but I somehow got into Cor Cornell. It was like, <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I'm going to Cornell. Um, so I went to Cornell for a year and loved a lot about it, but really didn't love their theater department that much. Um, and so determined that summer after my fr the summer what would have been the summer between my freshman and sophomore year that I wanted to drop out and go to act to a conservatory to a two-year acting conservatory um to the horror of every adult in my <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question <laughs> <laughs> apart from my parents who um uh bless them supported the idea after a couple oh, of great. days but um but I mean every my like every other adult in my life took me out to coffee and sat me down and was like, you are like, you cannot throw away an Ivy league education to go get an associate's degree in acting. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I hear you. And I'm pretty sure it's the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> what was your uh, major at Cornell? It was acting. Oh, it was acting. Okay. I didn't know if you were taking like, if, if those people were pushing you like, well, why don't you take some accounting classes just in case? No, no. no, no. I mean, they were like, you're obviously going to be an actor, but go get the Ivy League, League education. But Oh, um, okay. I see. I see. Yeah. But I transferred to uh, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City, which is a two-year program. Um, and you and just, just performance. It's, it's a conservatory. And I loved that so much. And it was 100% the right decision. So for being a conservatory, did you have, instead of classes on like, oh, here's your four gen eds you don't care about than the actual one thing you want to do, was it like theater acting and TV acting and here's how you hit your mark? Oh, that's really cool. And and dialogue and accents and movement and um, theater history and, you know, play analysis and um yeah, I mean, and that that was really my frustration with Cornell because when when you know what you want to do since you're four, like your entire my entire experience of growing up was like, get me to New York, like I like I want to be around people who are as serious about this as I am. And at Cornell, um, because it's a liberal arts school, anybody could take acting classes, uh, and even as an acting major, you wouldn't get to act only with other acting majors until you were a junior. And so my whole first year, I was in acting classes with people who were like, wanted to be lawyers. And this was their like easy A class. This was yeah. like, they were fucking around in. And it was so frustrating because I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. You you spent your whole life waiting to go. Now yeah. you're there. And it's probably less people into acting than when you were doing your high school plays. <laughs> totally. So, so then to get to um, Ada and every single person there was as passionate about it. I mean, maybe not everyone was quite as passionate, but everyone was there to do the same thing. <laughs> right. And uh, and to only be doing that all day, every day was just heaven. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, really, education should be more like that anyway. Totally. Yeah. And also, I don't, the other benefit of that decision was that it was a lot cheaper and it was a two-year program. <laughs> so I, I also <laughs> j- didn't have the weight then of like an unbelievable amount of student debt when I graduated. And that might be the only time ever where someone said that moving to New York City to go to a school was a cheaper option than something else. <laughs> I believe universities are expensive. Yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> so from the conservatory, are you working as well? Because I imagine it's so intensive that you probably didn't really have time to like audition and do your full course load. So f- that's funny that you asked that. So it was it was actually against the rules to audition yeah. while you were in school. Um be- because I think I think the temp they were they knew that the temptation would be too great that you'd get a part and then you'd get distracted and they were really trying to create this environment where they could um you know you could just have these two years in this creative bubble however that summer but went so after my freshman year at Cornell I went to New York and that was where I had this realization that I needed to move schools and during that summer I had happened to hook up with these um, women and had written a play, um, called 36, 24, 36. I mean, I'd never, I'd written one play in high school, two plays in high school. Um, I really had no business writing a play, but, uh, I did. And, um, and it ended up getting accepted into the New York fringe festival for the following summer. So, so in the summer in between my first and second year at Ada, I suddenly had this production in New York (laughs) of this play that I'd written. And so I had to go beg for a special dispensation from the Dean to let me act in that, that summer, which he allowed me to do. Um, Because you had it done ahead of time. Yeah. Well, like, what was he going to say? Like, no, you can't act in this play that you wrote that's being produced in New York. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's true. And it was at least over the summer. So it was like, it didn't get in the way of my studies. Awesome. Yeah. So you kind of, hit it hard and got started early in your education. Yeah, that's great. So at the conservatory, um, it it was a mix of classes and everything. You covered that. Did you also cover writing or did you focus on acting? Because you didn't realize you wanted to be a writer then. Yeah. So that school is, is just for actors. It's not. Oh, okay. It's that specific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So no, I didn't take any writing classes. I I still to this day have never taken (laughs) Uh, a playwriting or screenwriting class, even though I now teach them, which is what it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, but, but the funny, th- the funny thing was that particularly at that time, there was so much messaging around, like, you have to be an actor or a writer or a, or a director or a producer, but you cannot do multiple of those things. Like I, I had an agent um, after I got out of school who, who literally said to me, well, are you an actor or a writer? And I was like, well, can I be both? Because this seems to be working out pretty well because I'm like writing plays, they're getting produced in New York, I'm going to act and like, seems like a win-win to me. And he was like, people are going to get confused. They're not going to understand you have to pick one. And so I was like, okay, well then I guess I'm an actor. I mean, I, uh, but so then, so then this crazy period began where I kept writing plays partly like for my own sanity, because being an actor, just auditioning all the time is horrible and and, yeah. so, and like <laughs> not that creative. So I just was writing these plays to like not lose my mind and to have some kind of like authentic creative expression. And they kept getting produced. <laughs> so, I, so I got to this, and then I would get to act in them. So I got to this point where I had had seven plays produced in New York and around the country, but it wasn't on my website. I was like an in the closet playwright. And, and I wouldn't tell people this, like I would, I would write to agents to tell them that I was acting in this play, but not tell them that I'd written it. It was just, it was like, this is totally bizarro. It seems so backwards. Like you're hiding this incredibly successful part of your <laughs> career. <laughs> like, don't worry, I'm not that successful. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not that smart. Don't worry about it. Uh, and, and what's really funny is that now, so I graduated from acting school 10 ish years ago that now in acting schools, they're all offering like classes on like how to write and produce your own work. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, it seems more common than not that someone in show business does multiple things. Right. Yeah. So the, the writing kind of happened by accident. It seems like it did. And how did that translate to now movies? Cause you've written three movies. Is it? Um, something like that. Three movies, three TV shows, something like that. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. So basically, I think it was three years after I graduated from acting school, I was getting increasingly frustrated again, as I said, with the roles and and the roles for women in film are even worse than the roles for women in theater. Um, so I, it just like, it was increasingly demoralizing to be at these like auditions with 300 other incredibly beautiful, talented women all fighting to play like naked body number five. You know, it was just like, what are we doing here, people? Um, and so I was having lunch with a, a classmate of mine from Ada, Caitlin Gold, and we were sort of ranting about this. And we and at that point, we'd both acted on so many sets that were just kind of like poorly run. The writing wasn't that good. Um, and And we were sort of like having this like rant session of like, of like, we could, we could do that. I was like, I could write a better movie than that. She's like, we could produce a better movie than that. Like we're way more organized than these people. Um, and sort of over the course of that lunch, we decided, we came up with this plan and I was like, I've never written a movie before, but I've written plays. Like I could probably figure it out. Um, and so we did. <laughs> so, so, so we set out then on this, um, I mean, it's like one of those situations where, thank God we knew it. We didn't know what we were getting ourselves into because if we had, we probably would not have made this plan. But um, we we're just like, yes, we're going to make our own feature film. Um, and I wrote it and I, then I rewrote it 52 times because I didn't know how to write a movie and <laughs> took 52 times to get it right. And we basically had film school by coffee date. Like we, we, we made spreadsheets of every indie film producer and production company we could find in New York city and just started cold calling and emailing them and just asking them if they, if we could take them to coffee and they would like basically tell us how to make a movie. <laughs> wow. And I don't know why, but enough of them said yes, that we slowly sort of started piecing together how to do this. Um, and that's how we made our first movie. That's awesome. And for anyone listening who wants to make something, like, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, write it and make it and then don't stop calling. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like, if like, make, make the goal, set the shoot dates, and then figure it out. My my husband often teases me that my primary uh, talent in life is painting myself into corners that I have no way out of. Other than <laughs> I think that's how people succeed, though. You just <laughs> do it and then figure it out later. Yeah, you commit publicly to something and then you have to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. It's sink or swim. So, <laughs> no, I, I love that though. I love the the hustle and I love the ambition and just like, why not us? Yeah. And your your first, I mean, you rewrote it fifty two times. Which you, anyone, anyone who's trying to write something, just write it because your first one's going to suck, no matter who you are. You're not going to knock it out of the park. Yeah. Um, but your first screenplay, because it was fifty two drafts, but it was the same screenplay. That was the first movie that actually got made. Mm -hmm. Oh cool. wow, that is impressive. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called Imagine I'm Beautiful, and we made it um, for eighty thousand dollars which we scraped together by hook and by crook. And uh, I mean, literally by asking every person we ever met for money <laughs> and most of them saying no. Mm -hmm. um, and we shot it, we shot it in 2011. It came out in 2013. It got a distribution deal, which was like a miracle because we, nobody knew who we were. We had no, I mean, nobody knew who any of the actors were in our movie. We were just like the, the small, you know, tiny. Yeah. we're just, uh, it was a tiny film, um, but we ended up getting a, a 10 city theatrical release and wow. um, through a distributor and then a digital release, which um, felt like being Cinderella. You know? like, well, especially even eight, 10 years ago, streaming was not what it is today. Totally. Yeah. Um, and also through that experience, we came to learn the pitfalls of indie film distribution. <laughs> uh, and so that led me to, to self-distribute Bite Me in its initial um, initial incarnation of distribution. Now we're working with a distribution company on the international release, which is about to happen. But um, we did a we did a self-release tour first. So it, we did in the summer of 2019, we did a 51 screening, 40 city, three month tour of the film in an RV. We drove 13,001 miles around. Oh, that's so awesome. Country. We did 51 screenings in 90 days, which is bad shit. <laughs> but it was the most fun um, I've ever had. And we made yeah. more 
we made more money from the first week in ticket sales alone doing that than we did from our, from my entire first film through a distribution company. Ouch. That hurts to hear. Yeah. I, I'm sure it hurt for you, but that hurts to hear <laughs> even. Wow. Uh, that, that self-touring thing is really awesome. I love that. Yeah. It, we called it the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. <laughs> And you and nailed we, the timing, 2019, yeah, oh summer 2019, <laughs> if you just no waited eight kidding. months. <laughs> no kidding. And it's funny because now that the film, so that happened then, and then we had a couple of stop, like pandemic related sort of like hiccups of trying to get our international release because the whole market went weird, um, understandably, because everyone was freaking out about the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, but now that we're re-releasing, it's almost like people are have like a sense of nostalgia about the film really early because because it was like the before times and it was the times where <laughs> like people are like remembering, oh my God, we went out in costume to this party and met these people and like um, had this really joyful time and wasn't that cool. Because 2019 was a decade ago now. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really cool. I mean, it just... I'm I'm sure there's struggles and everything. You're just glossing over giving us the highlights, but it just sounds like you just kept, and I don't mean this as an insult at all, just kind of like falling into things. Like, yeah, I'm going to try yeah. this. Hey, it worked. I'm going to try this. Hey, it worked. And I know it wasn't that easy, but it just sounds really cool the way you're laying it out. Yeah. And so it was, in, it, everything has been incredibly hard. Yes, and, I'm sure. <laughs> and I don't want to gloss over that because I, I hate when people do that in interviews and you're like... <laughs> They're like, I'm not having it. And you're like, either that's true and I hate you or you're lying. <laughs> right. They're lying because it's not true. <laughs> um, so everything's been incredibly difficult. But, but what you're describing is true. Like, it sort of feels like my whole career has been that trick where a magician hands you a handkerchief and asks you to pull it out of the hat. And then it's like connected to another handkerchief and another handkerchief. <laughs> and another. So it was like, I wanted to be an actor. And then like this whole other set of things have happened. Um but you're still acting. <laughs> I am still acting, right. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of getting to do the best version of acting because I'm literally getting to write the best parts I can imagine and play them. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, what do you want to play next? Go ahead and write it. <laughs> <laughs> what genre? What kind of character? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Bite Me is your, your kind of current movie. I mean, you did a tour in 2019, but now you're talking about its wider release. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Bite Me is a subversive romantic comedy about a real-life vampire and the IRS agent who audits her. <laughs> I, I like those uh, vampires in the real world kind of things. Yeah, well, and and the the impetus for the movie um, was that uh, I was acting on the set of Boardwalk Empire, and it was a long shoot day and got to chatting with one of the extras. And over the course of this 13-hour day, she revealed to me that she was a vampire. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was my response and I was like okay tell me more um and she explained that she's part of this literally global community of people who believe that they need to either drink blood or feed on energy to stay healthy um and so I went down and fell down the internet rabbit hole the YouTube rabbit hole of this community and and these folks and was just like like so so amazed and in, and fascinated but also like kind of inspired by them in a way because so many of them have been you know shunned by their families ostracized from they, you know they they really a lot of them sort of live on on the fringes of society as a result of this but to believe in something and to and to be so to have the courage to stand so strongly in this identity that you believe in and to risk social alienation and mockery and everything else i i just was like so compelled by that combination and and wanted to write a movie about it yeah that's interesting cuz uh, you had sent me the trailer right before we started talking and they you do specify in the trailer like there's nothing supernatural about this and i kind of was like is that like a red herring? But now that you're explaining the the origin of it, it makes yeah. more sense. Yeah, um, and we got we've we've ha we've gotten to meet a lot of them too. And when we were on tour, um, the king and queen of the Austin vampires came to our screening, and they loved it, which was very. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's beyond niche. Like if you're in that community <laughs> and someone makes a movie about you, you totally. have to turn up. Like you're not yeah. missing that. <laughs> yeah, 
No, and as far as I as far as I know or they know, this is the only film that's ever been made. I've never heard of a, a vampire movie that wasn't, you know, some form of supernatural, whether, you know, it was comedy or serious or yep. whatever lore you're following. Yep. So that's a, that's a really cool origin to it, too, that you were just having this random conversation, and now you have a fully produced and released done movie about it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things happened in between those points, but yes, it is very Well, cool. of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, did you find making, because this is your second one now, your third one is kind of pending? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was shooting in March 2023. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Did you find doing the second one was loads easier than the first, or was it just a different set of challenges? I did not find it loads easier. It might have been a little bit harder from the perspective that we did a big budget jump. So the first one we made for eighty thousand, and the sec and this one we made for half a million. Wow, um, that's quite a jump. <laughs> it's quite a jump. So so raising the money for this was really really hard and took um, three between three and four years. Um, and 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 to, for me, the raising the money period is like the hardest part because. Um, it's the least creative. It's the most, you're just sort of at the whims of other people. Um, and, and it's the period of time where the, where success is not yet a certainty, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. like you could, you could try to raise money for three years and not ever get to make your movie. Um, right. You get 75% of the way there and it's like, well, it's not quite enough to do it. We can't. Right. Right. Um, so, so that was really hard. I, I, there were other things that were easier. And of course I couldn't have raised that much if I hadn't had a successful first movie at a smaller scale, particularly because again, I didn't, I never went to film school. I have no, I have no pedigree that would uh, prompt people to give me money without like a really proven track record. Right. You got to get that portfolio going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. And th so then, yeah, there were certain ways in which it was easier. And then in, in other ways it was honestly harder. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. It's both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also mentioned you wrote some TV shows. I did. Um, so I, I, uh, I got the opportunity to write for the, as a, as a staff writer for the New Yorker presents, which okay. is um, Amazon and, and the New Yorker magazine teamed up on this show that premiered at Sundance and um basically it was like we took different stories from the New Yorker, whether fiction or nonfiction and turned them into short um, movies um, that then got pasted together into episodes. It's sort of like each episode you're watching is like an issue of the New Yorker. Oh, that's cool. In video form. So I got to adapt Miranda July's short story, Roy Spivey for film, which was really exciting. Yeah, that is cool. Um. And then I and then I wrote a TV series. I I originated a TV series that um, I sold and is being made into a show right now. Can't give specifics on that. I'm guessing. Uh, Not quite yet. <laughs> no, it's, it's called The Dark Pieces, um, and it's starring an A-list actress. And I will be able to talk about it soon. <laughs> All right. Well, save our email. We'll do it again. <laughs> uh, and there was one other thing I wanted to ask about, because uh, I know you've had a ton, like I was reading through your bio and I was like, we could be talking for three hours. Um, but you also did a TED talk that was like monumentally successful. So what was that whole experience like? Because the TED talks were everything for years. Yeah. Um, so so mine was called, is called, uh, What It's Like to Be a Woman in Hollywood. And um so speaking of the of the pulling the handkerchief out of the hat uh, <laughs> nature of my career, um, so so there was all the sexism that I experienced as an actress, which you kind of expect, you know, like the the abuse and the whatever. Um, but when I became a filmmaker, was really when I understood just how sexist the industry is because people are horrible to actors generally, and you kind of know that they're going to be more horrible to actresses. But what I experienced as a filmmaker was so shocking. And this was, you know, I became a filmmaker in 2011. It wasn't 1975. Yeah. Um, uh, that I that I became really vocal about it and just started, because it, it's particularly at that time, people weren't really talking about it or they were talking about it in little pockets, but it hadn't really penetrated 
public consciousness, the, just just how the degree to which women had been and continue to be shut out of being behind the camera and writing, directing, producing positions um, and editing and cinematography and everything else, how, how the whole female perspective has been shut out of cinema basically since almost the beginning. Um, and so I said, then I started doing research into the data and, and like really coming to understand that 90%, 90 to 95% of all of the films that most of us have ever seen come from the white male perspective. And I, I was so horrified, not only that that was true, but that also that people didn't seem to really understand that. And that audiences didn't really understand either that that was tr true or the degree to which that fact is shaping everything else, right? Because stories build the world. <laughs> stories yeah, are your pop culture is your culture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They they tell us how to think about ourselves, how to think about each other, who matters, who doesn't matter, um, what we prioritize. And so honestly, I just started sort of mouthing off about it in Q and A's after screenings of Imagine I'm Beautiful, because I just felt like people needed to know. Um, and it was at the time when it was when people were really frightened to say these things out loud. Um, I mean, they still are to a large degree, but it, you know, it was be before me, many years before me too. Um, and so people, people knew the risk that it would pose to their careers if they said these things out loud. And I was dumb enough that I didn't know that <laughs> initially. <laughs> I, I did want to ask, like, did you feel like you were like, oh, I just got this movie made and it's the last one I'll ever do because I wrote this or I did this TED talk or. Well, it was interesting for sure. So I didn't know initially. And then people started telling me, I mean, literally this people would come up to me, including this one female, very successful female Oscar winning producer um, who, who was like my got my idol. Um, and she came to see a talk I did. And I was so excited that she was there. And she came up to me afterwards and, and said in no uncertain terms that if I didn't stop talking about this, that I would never have a career. Which was devastating. Yeah. Um, and then I got really mad. <laughs> I was like, and just like there came a point where I understood what the stakes were. And it seemed, I mean, it's like the mafia, right? Like the idea that this would not come out because because people were afraid. Right. It was so horrifying to me. And also, I just arrived at the conclusion that that if, in fact, my career was the cost, that that was a price I was willing to pay. That that the importance of this information getting out there and, and change happening was more important than whether or not I, um, you know, shot myself in the foot with respect to Hollywood. Um, so that was the conversation that I really had to have before doing that TED talk. Um, and that was the conclusion I came to. It was still really scary. I had to have a shot of whiskey before I did that talk. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, just, just for a million people to have seen it is scary enough, but then given the subject matter and the timing, because like you said, 2011 wasn't 1975, but it's also not now where things are probably still pretty bad, but from an outsider looking in, it looks like they're marginally getting better at least. Yeah, they're marginally getting better. Not 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 super, but not not fast enough, yeah. But also like there's at least there's at least a conversation now. And and I mean I, I will say so because that TED Talk was so successful, I got an an offer to write a book on the same topic, which I did, which I then had to figure out how to write a book in addition <laughs> to this place. Um but so I did over a hundred interviews with mostly women and some men up and down the industry for that book. Um, and the only way I could get people to talk to me, and this was, I got the book deal like on the heels of me too. So it was, you know, it was in that time. Um, the only way I could get people to talk to me was if I offered them the opportunity to go anonymous once they read the whole book. Um, so, so the deal was say whatever you want. And then if you want me to take your name out, when you read the, the book before it goes to publication, you can. And um, at least half of the women took their names out of the oh, book. Wow. Um, and one of them just won an Oscar uh, last year. Wow. 
which was painful. Yeah. Uh, if I'm being honest. Um, but anyway, but I'm so proud of that book and it came out, um, last year. It, it, no, sorry. Two years ago, right before COVID. Um, it's called the wrong kind of women inside our revolution to dismantle the gods of Hollywood. Um, <laughs> Great title. <laughs> and, and, and one indication of how dangerous it is still to, to say these things out loud. I mean, it's, it's just a true book. Like it's not, it's interviews. Yeah. It's not, it's not, I mean, it's not, it's passionate, but it's not angry. It's not, you know, um, and the, the book, when it came out, got covered by huge publications like, um, the Washington post and, um, the BBC and WNYC and Playboy even, and like, you know, huge, huge publications and not one single publication in Hollywood covered it, acknowledged that it existed. Yeah, go figure, right? <laughs> it's like you'd think industry magazines would talk about a book about the industry, but no. <laughs> no, no. Wow. Well, at least you did it and you got the that's TED Talk and obviously people saw it, people are reading the book, so. Totally. And that's and you're still making movies. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, what if that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I'm glad you went for it because Things aren't going to, I mean, it's maybe it's easier for me to say without a stake in the game and being that, you know, white male demographic, but it, things have to get better. And the only way they do is for someone to speak up. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know we kind of went in some different directions, but if you <laughs> want to tell people about um, like where they can see Bite Me and how to support that just before we wrap. Yeah. Um, so Bite Me um, will be available on iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, and Google Play starting February 8th, both um, in the U.S. and internationally. Um, and But but if you were listening to this before February 8th, we need to hit 400 pre-orders to get the algorithm to promote us <laughs> because, <laughs> because all of the internet is now about battling algorithms. Oh, um, yeah. So if you are listening to this and would pre-order it, that would be even better. Awesome. Well, um, Naomi, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, seriously, keep our contact information and we can do this again because you have a lot of stuff in the works. So <laughs> you could probably do this fairly regularly if you want. <laughs> okay, awesome. I will. And thank you so much again for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. I'd like to thank Naomi one more time for coming on the show to talk to me about her life, her career, her whole creative process, and of course, her newest movie, Bite Me, coming out February 8th. And as she said, if you pre-order, it really helps the uh, algorithms, which you know our entire lives are run by algorithms now, boost and promote her movie so more people can see it. So if it's something you want to check out, jump on it while you can, do the pre-order, help her out. Uh, she would really appreciate it, and it helps indies like her get to the next thing. As I said, that's Bite Me, available February 8th on uh, VOD, all the major platforms everywhere. You'll be able to find it. Make sure you like and subscribe. Got a lot more interviews, more new movie coverage, some unboxings. Uh, got comic reviews coming. Lots of stuff in the works you're not going to want to miss out. Also, make sure you listen to So Wizard Podcast every single week wherever you get your podcasts. So Wizard Podcast can also be found on Patreon, where for as little as $1 a month, you get multiple monthly bonus shows. SoWizardPodcast.com is your resource for reviews, recommendations, videos, merchandise, and more. We love hearing feedback, so drop us a note in the comments. Leave us something on social media. All of our accounts can be found after the show and in the show notes. And on a more personal note, a really good friend and I have an ongoing comedy comic series out. It's called Social Studies. It's a slice-of-life, coming-of-age, high school comedy about a group of friends who are kind of figuring out who they are, figuring out how much the friendship means to them, and uh, we try to capture that universal high school experience while telling some stories from our personal lives. Uh, we'll leave it up to you to determine what's real, what's not, what's exaggerated, what's wish fulfillment, all of the above. You can find all that and more at socialstudiescomic.com. Thanks. <laughs>